Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate your being here. I hope that you will come back tomorrow night at 7. This is a kind of a two-part event. It is about giving you and all of us skills. We can do this business if we're in community. I want to draw to your attention uh, the action table today. Please stop by to take action about building prisons and expanding them. I also want you to know that after the 1115 service, in this room, there will be cooperative process training, something that we have learned from Dr. Batts and uh, Visions. She is uh, one of our amazing resources. She is the executive director and co-founder of Visions, Inc. She leads the consultation and training components of the company. She's the author of Modern Racism, New Melody for the Same Old Tune, and Is Reconciliation Possible? She'll talk about those documents and how you can get them. She has written extensively on modern racism and multicultural organizational change strategies. She's the originator of the Visions training model and experiential workshop. She grew up in the segregated South in North Carolina, a graduate of Chapel Hill and got her PhD from Duke. We are in the hands of somebody who really knows what she's talking about. Will you enthusiastically and warmly welcome to this podium, Dr. Valerie Batts. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to be here. And in this 35 minutes, I want to share with you some, some, some ideas that will hopefully get you excited about coming back uh, tomorrow night. And um, I, I always like to start this kind of conversation by saying we're talking about some really serious issues here, aren't we? Yes. And how many of you believe we can do that and still be joyful? <laughs> All right, good. Because the truth is, I, I, last Friday I was here in Los Angeles and I gave a talk to a group of progressive educators and the theme of the talk was how to work and play hard in, te in education and specifically I was to talk about how do you keep the fun in talking about hard issues like race, class, and gender. And so I use as a theme from Emma Goldman, uh, I don't, if I can't dance, I don't want to be at your revolution. So. Uh, and, and I looked up Emma Goldman as I was preparing for it, and she, that was about the most funny thing she said. <laughs> she was right. She was quite serious about her work as a revolutionary and, uh, and an anarchist and all of that. And so, you know, in that spirit, though, th I've been doing this work since I was 16. Ed asked me if I was going to tell my story. I'm just going to tell a brief minute of it, especially to the young people here in the audience. When I was 16, they uh, closed Booker T. Washington High School, which was the high school that my father had attended in Eastern North Carolina, and, and was the high school that uh, black students went to, colored students at the time, we were called. And so my senior year, we went to Rocky Mount Senior High School, which was the desegregated high school. And the work that I started doing there is still the work that I'm doing. And I had to figure out how to make a living doing that, so I became a professional psychologist. But my real work is really about how do we create systems in which each person can thrive? And that's what the visions model is. And today I'm gonna just touch on a few points of that. There, some, Mr. John gave me a copy of a talk I did here in 2004 that, was, that I encourage you all to pick up a copy of and you can see some of, in more detail some of our information. But I'm gonna share a few key points today. And the first thing I'm gonna, the first point I'm gonna talk about is the guidelines which you, have in your, in your, on your table, and I'm actually not gonna talk about them, I'm going to um, show them to you. Just a second, I'm figuring out, this is my oldness here, this technology, how do you do this, right? So what I want to do is to start off by sharing with you some guide, the guidelines from the voices of young people. And I would like you to notice, we, one of our guidelines is notice, process, and content. So I'd like you to notice how is it for me to listen to this information through the voices that are on this video? And for those of you who are young people, I'd like you to listen and, let a, and also notice what is it like to hear young people talking about issues of race? So we're gonna start with that as our first little activity and intro. And uh, let's see, we, we figured it out earlier. Race. 
talk about, talk about, talk about, talk about race, race, talk about race. It's time for a, ch- 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 a change, something like that. I've learned a lot about myself that I just try to avoid a situation and what I really need to do is just kind of hit it head on and not be scared. I stop myself because I don't mean to offend nobody when I start speaking in Spanish. Look at our religion, from Jews, Muslims to Christians, we just all here wishing. Somebody white was making fun of her and calling her the N-word and something inside me snapped and said, hey, this girl was insulting me. Myself, my color, my family tree. And then after 9-11, I was just super high, like, hearing comments from people and yelling, like, go back to the Taliban to me and stuff like that. We are the youth of a nation ruled by conspiracy. We are taught in school, but learn the most from what we hear and see. And I wonder what we're resting for because we are not yet free. The first guideline is try on. Try on every part of that idea or thought or belief before you disagree. There is only two groups in Cleveland that I've been around. And it's just blacks and whites, you know, and we don't have any Arabs and things like that. We are all born, you know, from God, and um, it just—it's not in our—it's not in our hands to pick uh, what we want to be or what language to speak. So we all have to get along. A scarf, but in Arabic, it's called a hijab. Uh, can you tell me the um, reason why y'all uh, um, wear scarf? In our Quran, um, which is like our holy Bible, um, that a woman should be covered. And I don't know if you've ever t- paid attention to Jesus' mother, she always had a veil on. If you're in a discussion, after you, someone says something, maybe seems a little far out to you, you've tried it on, that's the first step. We also want you guys to recognize that it's fine to disagree, and that's very important to disagree, and work with those ideas. to disagree and work with those ideas rather than to try to change or mold or or uh, move away from the disagreements. I like Joe and Eva and Laura and who they are because they're all nice, they cool people. Just be yourself. You know what, Joe? Don't be like, man, I gotta say, what's up, dog? Get my kids and be yourself. And it don't just like stereotype me like, like that. And here in this conference, we're part of the minority. On the bus, they were like, these middle-class white people came and take up this land and trashed it. Or oh, then, yeah. when you go somewhere else, they're like, the white people did this, or the white people did that, and you just are like, okay. <laughs> it's not okay to blame, shame, or attack. Even something very subtle, like tapping your foot, or rolling your eyes, or like slouching in your seat. And also, it's not okay to blame, shame, or attack yourself. We're all learning here. If I turn on the television, I would feel like I am a second-class citizen, that I'm overweight and I need to grow my hair and needs to be straightened out. Racism isn't just painful to black people. It's just not painful to Asians. It's not painful to immigrants. It's painful to the white people. It's painful to all of us that you are missing out on a whole lot. You're missing out on getting to better know that you are not only born here on the soil, but you are have roots that go to somewhere else. It was going to be a reinforcement of the stereotype about black male sexuality and, you know, sort of just being seen as a black hunk as opposed to the breadth of what these boys brought to the table and sort of fearful that they were stepping into that stereotype. To step into your greatness, you'd still need help. When we say self-focus, we mean I statement so that when you're talking in a group, we want to say that that's not okay and we want you to speak for yourself and not for the group. It's so traditional for adults to be in charge. Poor, you try sexy, don't be speed. They don't really realize that youth is our future. You guys going down to the church too? No. It builds a stronger character for you because when you say if you go to a job or anything that you try to do in life, you're going to want your voice to be heard. Practice both and thinking. And I think a lot of us were taught that usually issues are an either or situation. It's either this or it's that. And the truth is, it can be both this and that. Oh, I got a call. Hold on, okay? What's up, guys? What, what is it? Oh, 
What you coming over here for? What I you don't like black no. women no more? Okay, why don't you go over there with your white friend? I mean, now nah, I mean. Kind of it. Y'all still my friend, but yeah. she's my friend too. Is our hair not straight enough for you? I, I can't have a white friend. Get your friend, get Snow White, and get a phone out of here. <laughs> We're gonna have some us, man. You must have been having some feelings when they were saying this to you. Uh, yeah. Like you're a deserter, you're a traitor. And Laura standing over there, and how hard it is to kind of be separated and be isolated, and then kind of come back into the group and reintegrate. And we all agreed that yes, we were joking, and I felt the pain that I that I must I want to say that you had Laura standing over there, and this is just a skit. And I have a hunch that it sometimes happens a lot in your school. Yeah. So to do something so real sometimes is hard to do. <laughs> Kind of made me ashamed. Feel ashamed to be a white person when that kind of activity happens. Right. I know that I do those do those things and don't even give it a second thought. But now watching it happen, I think it's something that I should be ashamed of and that I shouldn't or that I want to stop doing. They usually don't have these cross racial conversation and dialogues. They have them back home. I didn't want to lose Laura as a white ally. She's a very strong voice. My fear was that they weren't able to see her pain. And the last one is honor confidentiality. We don't want you to assume that just because someone decided they wanted to open up in their work team that they want to talk about it outside the work team. It wouldn't be outside the work team. It wouldn't be okay without asking her permission first. The group that I came like Friday morning, um, <laughs> we were kind of little and mature, naive, and the group that's leaving today were worldly and mature, more open-minded and culturally enriched. I know that I'm not alone and I'm not going back to my city by myself and I know that you guys are going to go back doing the same thing and I know that through the relationships that we've made here we can all keep in contact and learn from each other. Just meeting all these different like youth groups and all these different organizations and hearing what they do for their community, it's made a big impact on me. And it's made me like, you know, just start thinking about what I can do for my own community. We all came here so we could learn from each other to be leaders of the future. All right, turn the light back on for now. Yeah, nice, huh? What feeling, just to take a, mo just a couple of minutes, what feelings come up as you hear young people digging into these issues? What comes up for you? I just hear a couple, yeah, you want to speak? Oh, you're going to pass the, she's going to take the, she's going to pass the mic. Who has feel, what thoughts or feelings come up as you hear the guidelines? Who else has got a mic? You are taking, you're managing the mic too, okay. Yep, there's, there's a person. As they're getting pe folks, I just want you to try on that part of the issue it, of modern racism is just getting comfortable talking about it. Modern racism suggests that this issue is over and dead and we don't need to talk about it. How many of you think that's true? That it's over? I don't see anybody raising their hand. So the next step is how do I learn to talk about it so that I can think through what might be actions I can take? So this is the first step, talking about it. Okay. Well, um, what it brought up initially when I saw it was um, tears and it, a combination of um, you know, the continued sadness and also the hope. Um, I'm very committed personally to um, children experiencing that they are loved mm -hmm. and, um, and, and to see this is still going on, you know, makes me sad. To see that it's on, you know, out there and people are working on it, it gives me hope. So I'm caught in that, I don't know whether it's called melancholy or what, but yes, that's what yes, comes up for me. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And the, uh, thank you. And the guideline of both and thinking allows us to hold both of those emotions and, the, and, and to have them both be okay. Beautiful. Yes. We, does somebody else want to share some, a thought or a feeling? Well, my thought when I saw that was yes. just relief that kids are actually talking about it and working through their feelings and trying, at least some of them, trying to understand others points of view and where they're com coming from and experiences. When I was in high school, probably, you know, five or several years after 
after schools were integrated, if you talked about racism, that meant you were yeah. a racist, and so nobody talked yeah. about it. And you know, kids now are talking about it and working through these issues. Yeah, I hear you. Anybody else want to share? Yeah. I felt very encouraged because, um, well, just encouraged and uplifted by the possibilities. And I enjoyed the fact that by having these specifics try on and so forth, that it's not just asking people to have an open mind and heart. We're giving them something to dig into as an actual practice, the behavior. And then hopefully thoughts and feelings will come into sync with that. Yes, good, <laughs> good. One more. I felt um, glad, glad that somewhere, and I don't think this is really widespread that people are talking about it, because I know in the groups that I go to, it's almost like it's taboo, that we're all here, but you never, in social groups, you never bring up the subject of race. It's just something that it's the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. So I felt a sense of encouragement and glad that at least somewhere on the planet <laughs> it's being discussed, but I also felt a sense that once you start talking about it, you have to do something. Mm -hmm. You can't just talk. Uh, yeah. It compels you to act. So I'm encouraged, but I'm also um, wanting us to get past talking and, and to the point of doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. One more comment now, then I'll get, there'll be more. Yes. Okay. Bill Rankin, a uh, former priest at All Saints, said something once which I found very freeing. He said, look, we all have some prejudice. Mm -hmm. And we spend a lot of time denying this. You know, oh, I'm free of the, that. I don't have any of that. But, you know, if, if you can accept the fact that we are not perfect yet, it, it really frees you up to, to be open about where you're at. Very exciting, very beautiful, yes, yes. So modern racism, and there's an article here called Modern Racism and Gun Violence, which I encourage you to take a look at along with the other materials that the, that the uh, staff has prepared. But in this article, uh, David Brooks, you may have heard of that columnist, speaks about the fact that for many years we wanted to think about racists as some individual act of evil or badness around that some person might have, but that modern racism, racism is really a system of, of discrimination and, and it's about the structural way in which our culture and our society has embedded the, the, uh, the assumptions of superiority and inferiority. And in a way, none of us in this room had anything to do with that. We didn't create this. We inherited a legacy. And so part of the, the, the difficulty in talking about it is that we have har a hard time in the United States talking about our history in general and talking about specifically the legacy of oppression and colonization. Felipe Garcia and I, who, who uh, consult together here at All Saints uh, for the next couple of days, were listening to um, the, the radio coming down and they were talking about this new movie about, the, about slavery, 12 Years Enslaved, have you heard about this? And, 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 and they were suggesting that this is really the first movie since Roots that has actually even addressed the topic of slavery in a serious way. That's pretty compelling given how, um, how much slavery is a part of our history, not to speak of the genocide of native people and the colonization of indigenous people and, and Mexican people here on the West Coast and, and Southwest. So the legacy of oppression that we as a society have is, is enormous, and how do we address the collective cultural shame that we carry as a consequence of that, I think is another way to frame this question. To, and it starts with acknowledging that none of us created it, none of us willed it, and if we, if we could have what we want, we wouldn't have it, and yet it is still with us. That's the both end of it, that we can't, because we want it to go away, we can't just act like it's going away because it keeps recycling and coming out in new ways. I, I, my work at graduate school at Duke was looking at a concept called modern racism, and this was in the late 70s. And we were studying the fact then that most public policy 
polls were saying that racism was a thing of the past in the United States. So we asked the question, what year did racism end? <laughs> right? right? <laughs> and, and, if, and, then, and of course, that's ludicrous, right? So if it didn't end, then where did it go? Right? So modern racism speaks to the way in which the, race, the character of racism changed between the late 60s and uh, the mid 70s when I was back in graduate school doing this research. But do you know that was in this century? How many of you know we had a Civil Rights Act of, of 1875? Yeah, right? So we've been here before as a nation in 1875 and then by the late 19s, the late 1890s, 1900s, there was resistance, right? But we had more elected officials of color in office in the early 20th century than we actually have today. So we've been here before, and we didn't learn the lesson. So the resistance to um, the early uh, at attempts at equity result didn't, didn't won, essentially they won, and so then we had the institution of Jim Crow, which was the, which was the institution to which, into which I grew up. The colored and white water fountains in North Carolina were taken away when I was 13. We have any 13-year-olds in the, in the audience today? Anybody almost 13? How, how old are you? How old are, is, I'm looking at the young lady. How old are you? Uh, I'm looking at you turning away from me. Yeah, I'm looking, how old are you? I'm, I'm talking to your daughter. Yes, how old is she? Yeah? 18. 18? Okay, and how about the young lady? Yeah, how old are you? Six. So it, it, if you think about in seven years, you, that was when the colored and white, five years, think about what you're, you're already clearly forming your opinion about who you are and how the world is, right? And so growing up in eastern North Carolina in the 50s, it was clear that there was this message, and this gets to this, that the United States was a melting pot, right? And yet, I remember saying to my friend one day, what about us? We didn't melt into the pot, <laughs> right? So we never bought this idea of the melting pot, which is part of what led me to be curious about, is there another way to see this? If the goal is equity, and if the goal is inclusion, and if the goal is a United States in which everyone is valued, how do we get there from here? I remember thinking about that when I first started studying about politics. So, this model that we use in vision suggests that recognizing, understanding, appreciating, and utilizing differences, recognizing, that is seeing the difference, unlike what someone said that when you were growing up you were taught not to see them, seeing the difference, then understanding what does it mean that we had a Civil Rights Act in 1875 and that we're having, one, and that we're having a fight to undo that right now, i.e. the voter rights issues that just passed, you see the link between that and that, and, and that, that rec that's understanding it, then it's appreciating it. So what does it really mean for me to try on a, a whole different way of thinking about the world? And then utilizing it. So how do we think about using all of our differences? So the, the notion of multiculturalism starts with learning how to, to, to be in relationship to difference. People often say, well, if I'm looking at differences, isn't that going to be divisive? What we're suggesting is that pluralism is the acceptance, the appreciation, the utilization, and the celebration of both similarities and differences. So again, both and thinking allows us to hold on to all the ways that we're similar and to also fully bring in all the ways that we're different so that we have a salad bowl or fruit salad uh, metaphor instead of a melting pot metaphor. So that's the basis, one of the key elements of modern isms. And it says that modern, that this, oh, this process has to occur at four levels, personal, interpersonal, institutional, and cultural. And that the institutional and cultural levels are the levels at which racism and other forms of oppression are structured into the culture. So you, you're born into this world Young, my 26-year-old my is born into a world where it, she was born in a hospital in Richmond, Virginia, where we noticed that at night the nurses tend to be African-American or Latino, people of color, low, it's the, it's the lower-paying jobs. 
uh, less the LPN uh, RN distinction happens. So in the evening, they're black and Latino nurses, and the black babies get held. During the day, they're white nurses, and the white babies get held. Nope, that's unconscious. It's not something that people are intentionally doing, and yet it perpetuates the notion of avoidance and separation of the races. So I wanted to show, if I can, one more quick clip about how that is playing out. These levels are important, and I'm hoping you're going to come back and hear more, but I'm gonna, I want to share this one clip to just let you see how this is such an unconscious thing. And um, let me see if I can get back to it. Sorry. <clears throat> this one right here. So two, this is uh, done by a young person also. In Brown versus Board of Education, the famous case that desegregated schools in the 1950s, Dr. Kenneth Clark conducted a doll test with black children. He asked them to choose between a black doll and a white doll. In most instances, the majority of the children were a white doll. I decided to reconduct this test as Dr. Clark did to see how we've progressed since then. Can you show me the doll that you like best or that you'd like to play with? Show me the doll that is the nice doll. And why is that the nice doll? She's white. And can you show me the doll that looks bad? Okay. And can you give, and why does that look bad? Because it's black. Hmm. And why do you think that's a nice doll? Because she's white. And can you give me the doll that looks like you? Fifteen out of the twenty-one children preferred the white doll. Okay, so you see our work is still, we have work to do still, huh? That was a young person doing that experiment with her peers. Just this was uh, 2010. There's a there's a Anderson Cooper did a study. I don't have the time to share it, but I have the clip of he did a study about this with blacks, whites, Latinos, showed up over and over consistently. Yeah, it was based. It was a takeoff from that. This was done by a teenager who was looking at it. But Anderson's, yeah, yeah. I don't remember what part of the country, but if you look at the Ander, I can the Anderson Cooper link. If you go to Anderson Cooper and you put in doll studies, he did a very extensive study to, sh and, and the point is, at the cultural level, now if I can get back to my PowerPoints, at the cultural level, what's changed in our culture that would, that would allow this to be different? What's changed? Anybody have an idea? Anything changed? Ah, the president, ah, so what is it, what is it? How many people think about the way in which President Obama's victory what are the ways in which President Obama's victory may forward us on this journey? And what are some ways in which it may hold us back? Let's hear a couple of thoughts about that question. W ways it will help with this and ways it will hold us back. Did you, we have a hand here. Hi. Um, what I was going to say, even in the earlier, I feel like the problem right now is, and probably always has been, especially with those studies, is that it's adapted at home and that it's what is taught at home. And if that was upheld, if inclusion was held up at home, I don't think those kids would be as likely to be, have the answers that they do. And I feel like as much of a, obviously, Obama fan I am, at the same time I have felt, and Ed and I have talked about this, that I have seen over the past, I would say, three or four years in the South especially, that, it, well, everywhere, but whether it's um, black and white, gay, whatever it may be, I feel like there's this surge of this last gasping breath of the white um, patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And it has 
become very intense. I mean, just recent experiences down south. And so I think if you really, I don't know what the studies show, but I think one day in history it may show that there was so much anger from um, oppression um, of these particular sectors, mostly I, I think not to get too political, but born out of the whole rage and anger from the, the Tea Party so people and those kind of groups that it has fueled a resurgence um, of racism and homophobia and everything else that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. So as good as it is, it definitely comes with that resurgence, I think. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, we, the studies we did at Duke on modern isms back in the 80s show that when a, when a, raci when a cl racial climate is ambiguous, white folks will, will act, are less likely to act in non-racist ways. So Obama's election creates an ambivalence and ambiguousness. Have we reached, have we therefore accomplished the goal? And so it creates this, um, this ambiguous situation. And that often, the, the data suggests when the situation, you see more old-fashioned racism when the situation is ambiguous, which is your point. So the part about that that I think we each have to own, though, is that if we're not, if the 80% of us who want to see a world in which this changes aren't acting, the 20% will continue to have the large, loudest voice. So, that speaks to what do we need to be doing, and that's part of what we're gonna be talking about Monday night, to see the link between issues like gun violence, the, the, prison, the um, birth to prison pipeline, economic injustice, women's rights, voting rights, healthcare, and immigration. All of those are manifestations of racism as well in how they're being implemented. If we don't see the links between those, we can get engaged in those issues without ever linking it back to this root cause. So it is, no, no, it is not um, an accident that most of the people who need health insurance are poor and are people of color, or that immigrants are having, that we're having such a difficult time in this country addressing effective immigration reform, that we're having a backlash against women's rights issues. So, you, so seeing those links gives us some, may, some ideas about how we may act on issues that are most important to us and still make that direct link to how this is, how addressing issues of race must be a part of this dialogue. Sometimes I go to get called to speak at places lately since the uh, Newtown situation where people want to talk about gun violence but they don't want to talk about race or poverty. And we can't talk about, and, and it's important that we keep making those links, which is part of what we want to do. So I appreciate your point. And so as not to leave you without any to-dos, if you come back Monday night, that's a to-do. <laughs> Another to-do is to make sure that today you find someone to talk about this conversation that we're having as a way to practice. Because learning to talk about it and learning to use the guidelines, especially when other people disagree with you, is a skill that will allow you to stay engaged in this conversation. So that's not a small thing. And if, and if you don't do anything but that, you're making a difference. And I also want to share with you that the model that we teach has identified five kinds of modernism behaviors that we as well-meaning individuals do. So the most insidious one of those is often avoidance of contact. So if I don't have re genuine, equitable contact with people who are different on all the dimensions of difference, then that's a place I can make a difference. If so, and, and it could be that I work with people, but I don't talk to them about these issues, or it could be that I have no place currently in which to have that dialogue. That's not true if you go to All Saints, there's, there's definitely opportunities, but making sure that you're doing what you can do, that's one. The other thing is this noticing differences that I'll say as, is important here, which is that, it's, it's sort of where I began, that if you were taught that the, 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 the non-racist thing to do is to not acknowledge differences, it's likely that, you're, that was a, the idea was, if I see difference, then I'm gonna code it as negative. Is that right? If I see difference is a negative, yeah. Difference is, it can be positive, it can be negative, it can be neutral, it is. So it's changing that mindset that will allow me 
to open up to recognizing differences. And for those who have been in, a his, in mostly historically included groups, that may be a new experience, and it's okay. And it may feel awkward at first, but we encourage you to do it. Okay, I got time for one more comment before it's, it's 11 o'clock. Yes. Uh, my wife and I had the privilege of spending two years in South Africa some years ago, 18 months before the election of Nelson Mandela mm -hmm. and six months after. Mm -hmm. And I was in awe of the great ideal in South Africa of a non-racial society. Mm -hmm. I said, what can they possibly mean by non-racialism? Non-racial democracy. But Nelson Mandela came in and he kept crying, South Africa is for all who live in South Africa, white or black or colored. We are a non-racial society. And um, it's, it, it, it uh, somehow, uh, you know, we were there for the election day of Mandela and we were, we were observing it at election booths in a big sports hall. The place was jammed. And a car roared up and uh, Desmond Tutu came out with somebody from the UN with him. And Desmond was in his red robes and he stood in the middle of the, of the hall. And it was a, this is the first time that black South Africans had ever been allowed to vote, mind you. Yeah. And Nelson, and, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Desmond stands there and he, he lifts his arms and he says, we are the rainbow people of God. Thanks be to God. And that whole question of being a rainbow people has stuck with me ever since. Yeah. A non-racial society in which everyone, regardless of race, is equal. Mm -hmm. I hope we, it's driving me way down in my heart all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good. So that's, we, 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 on the chart there, that's the pluralistic vision that I was expressing. Yeah. I also was working in South Africa during that time, so we'll have to have some more conversation about that story another time. I'm sorry. So, much, so, so do come tomorrow night if you can. Thank you very much. <laughs>